Okay, welcome back. In this video, we'll cover chapter number 18, uh, the reproductive system, uh, replacement and repair. Uh, first, a quick introduction to the chapter. Uh, cells and tissues uh, get damaged and simply just wear out over time. So these cells have to be replaced. Uh, asexual reproduction, or mitosis, is a process by which cells make exact copies of themselves and is essential to maintaining a healthy body. Now, ultimately, cellular reproduction leads to the complicated process by which humans reproduce new humans, or sexual reproduction. So without this ability, the human species would die out and a journey for the human race would end. All right, uh, learning outcomes for this chapter. Uh, be able to differentiate uh, mitosis from meiosis and the role of each of those in the human life cycle. Uh, be able to locate and describe the functions of the female reproductive organs. Uh, discuss female reproductive physiology, including the phases of the menstrual cycle, uh, oogenesis, follicle development, and ovulation. Discuss the effects of hormonal control on the female reproductive system. Uh, locate and describe the functions of the male reproductive organs. Discuss the male reproductive physiology, including spermatogenesis. Uh, discuss the effects of hormonal control on the male reproductive system. Uh, describe pregnancy and the stages of labor and delivery. And lastly, explain some common disorders of the female and male reproductive systems. All right, we'll start off with uh, tissue growth and replacement. And the first term we'll talk about here is mitosis. Now, cellular reproduction is the process of making a brand new cell. Now, cell division is when one cell will divide into two. You start off with one cell, you end up having another identical copy of that cell made. Now, asexual reproduction is when a cell can make identical copies of itself without the involvement of another cell. Now, cells that make up the human body are a certain type of cells called eukaryotic. EU and eukaryotic means uh, true, so it actually is a reference to having a true nucleus. So the prokaryotic cells are a reference to uh, bacteria because they're not as complex. And then eukaryotic cells are animal and plant cells. Now the genetic material of the cell, the DNA, is bundled into uh, packages of chromatin. These are known as chromosomes. Now the process of sorting the chromosomes so that each cell gets exactly the same number and exactly the same amount of genetic material is called mitosis. So mitosis isn't cell division, it's the division of the nucleus. And after that, the rest of the cell will divide. And mitosis is the only way that eukaryotic cells, you know, like our cells, can reproduce asexually. Uh, mitosis in your body, uh, like we just mentioned, mitosis is a form of asexual cellular reproduction because you're not involving any other cell. You know, one cell can do this basically by itself. You know, one cell producing two, and then two become four, and so on. Now, mitosis is needed for repair and regeneration of tissues. And also, growth is accomplished through the process of mitosis. All right, now we'll move on to sexual reproduction. Now, sexual reproduction is needed for the perpetuation of the species. That's how the any species continues on surviving is through sexual reproduction. You have to be able to produce more of that species. Now, sexual reproduction requires the assistance of another individual to produce offspring. They are not identical to each other. So you can have individual cells you know, splitting by themselves to make more copies of themselves. But for any kind of animal to reproduce, you need to have two people involved to produce offspring. Okay, sexual reproduction involves the union of a cell from one organism with a cell of another organism of the same species to produce a brand new organism. So in humans, the union of an egg cell from the female plus the union of a sperm cell from the males will give you the new offspring. All right, now we'll talk about uh, meiosis. This is related to mitosis, but it is uh, different in many ways. Uh, in animals, females will produce eggs, and the males will produce sperm, and these special cells are called gametes. So the term gamete is just another term for sex cells. Now, gametes are made by a special process called meiosis, also known as a reduction division. And it's called that because the daughter cells produced at the end of the process have half as many chromosomes as the original. All body cells in you have 46 chromosomes, or 23 pairs of chromosomes. Your sex cells only have 23, but that's how we get to the 46 in our normal body cells. 23 chromosomes from mom plus the 23 chromosomes from dad give you the 46 that you end up with. So the daughter cells will fuse together with the gamete from another organism, and then these chromosomes that they have are joined together, and that will give you the total number of chromosomes needed for the fully functional organism. All right, in humans, uh, total number of chromosomes is, is 46, 23 from mo the mother, 23 from uh, the father. If we don't have this process of meiosis, 
the resulting fertilized egg would end up with 92 chromosomes, which is way, way too many to be viable. So the number that you're looking for is 46 chromosomes. Anything higher than that is going to have problems. Anything lower than that is going to cause problems. All right, the 46 chromosomes are always paired, so you're going to have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And each pair will consist of one from your father and one from your mother. Now, chromosomes are matched based on their size and their shape and the kind of genes that they carry. And chromosomes are going to be numbered through numbers 1 through 23. Uh, the first 22 pairs are the uh, somatic chromosomes. And then the last pair, pair number 23, are the sex chromosomes. And they're called that because they help determine the sex of the baby. If there are two X chromosomes, or XX, then it's a female. If it's an X and Y chromosome, then it is a male. All right, the image you're looking at here is called a karyotype. This is the, chromosome, the chromosomes of one cell of a person matched together by size and then laid out. And you can see that they are numbered. See, 1, 22, and this would be the 23rd pair here. So on this image here, because there are two X's, this one would be a female. And this side of the image over here, again, 22 pairs, and here's the 23rd pair. You have an X and a Y. The Y chromosome is much smaller than the X. So just by looking at this image, you can tell that a person from image B would be male. A person from image A would be female. Just by looking at this karyotype. All right, now we'll talk about a clinical application. We'll talk about Down syndrome. Now, Down syndrome is a relatively common birth defect that will cause a short stature, heart defects, uh, increased risk for leukemia and Alzheimer's disease, and often uh, mental retardation. Now, the probability of a baby with Down syndrome increases with women who are over the age of 35. Now, although there is new research that shows men who are over 50 also are at increased risk. So the older you are, when you are pregnant increases the risk for many birth defects including down syndrome especially if your first pregnancy is beyond age 35 or so now down syndrome is caused by the presence of an extra chromosome uh, number 21 now sometime during meiosis what will usually happen uh, in, in the mother the chromosomes will fail to split so that will leave uh, some daughter cells with having an extra chromosome so that's why the formal name for down syndrome or Down syndrome is trisomy 21. Going back to this image here, this is normal. This is how a normal pairing of chromosomes should look. But for someone with Downs, they would have an extra chromosome here. They would have a third body there. That's why it's called trisomy 21. So just by looking at a karyotype, you can determine if someone has Downs or not. All right, so if that egg uh, with that extra chromosome is fertilized, the resulting fetus will have a third chromosome 21 versus a normal uh, regular pairing. All right, now I'll move on to the uh, human life cycle. Uh, mitosis and meiosis are absolutely necessary parts of the human life cycle because they're needed for cell replacement, repair, and of course the production of new organisms. Now eggs and sperm with only half as many chromosomes as other cells are produced by meiosis. These go through this process in organs known as the gonads. These are the testes and ovaries. Now the term gonad is a generic term. That's a reference to the primary, the primary organ of the reproductive system. So the gonads for males will be the testes. The gonads for females will be the ovaries. All right, during uh, sexual reproduction, the gametes will, will unite and combine their genetic material. And this union is called fertilization, or also known as conception. This is the beginning of a life at conception. Now this fertilized egg, the zygote, has 46 chromosomes. Now the zygote will reproduce millions of times through mitosis and will develop within the female that gestates in the uterus to go from a zygote to an embryo, an embryo into a fetus. All right, here are the early stages of the human life cycle, starting up here with uh, fertilization. That one cell will become two, then four, then eight, and it will keep doubling in number and number. Then until you get to the uh, embryonic stage here, that will further develop into a, a fetus, and then eventually having a newborn. All right, the reproductive organs are also known as the genitalia. Genitalia are divided into either primary or secondary genitalia. The primary genitalia are the gonads that produce the gametes. So for males that'd be the testes, for females that'd be the ovaries. Anything else is considered to be a secondary genitalia or, or an accessory organ. So it doesn't matter what it does, doesn't matter where it's found. If it's not a gonad, 
is considered to be a secondary structure, no matter how important it is. All right, we'll first start off with the female anatomy. Uh, in females, the primary genitalia are the ovaries, because they are the primary organs of the system, because they make the, uh, the egg cells. The secondary genitalia are the fallopian tubes, or the uterus, uh, the vagina, and the external genitalia called the vulva. Right, the ovaries? Uh, the ovaries are paired structures that are about three centimeters long, and they're found in the peritoneal cavity. There'll be one ovary on either side of the uterus. And the ovary is covered by a, a fibrous capsule called the tunica albuginea. This is made up of cuboidal epithelium. Now the interior of the ovary is divided into the cortex, which contains the eggs, and also the medulla, which contains the blood vessels and the nerves and lymphatic tissue. And it's surrounded by uh, loose connective tissue. And again, in terms, uh, cortex and medulla are not you know, specific just for the ovaries. They are generic regions of a structure. Cortex is always the outermost side, and medulla is more toward the middle. Right. Ovarian ligaments. There are several ligaments that hold uh, the ovary in place or suspend uh, the ovary. Mesovarium will suspend the ovary. And the uh, suspensory ligament will attach to the ovary uh, to the lateral pelvic wall. It will suspend it from you know, the top part, you know, like a chandelier is suspended from a ceiling. And then the ovarian ligament will anchor the ovary to the uterine wall from the bottom side of the ovary. The blood vessels, the ovarian artery, the ovarian branch of the uterine artery will travel through the mesovarium and dispensary ligament, supplying the ovary with oxygenated blood. Here's a profile view of the reproductive organs, or the internal reproductive organs. Uh, the vertebrae here, the backbone here. This part would be the last part of the sigmoid colon, kind of cut open. The rectum would be here. The body of the uterus would be here. Ovary would be here, and this part is actually would be coming out at you in a three-dimensional way. This is hard to represent that on a two-dimensional image. This part will be coming out toward you. And we'll talk about many of these structures as we get through this chapter. Ovary here, ovary here. You have the mesovarium, also known as a broad ligament, that will drape over the entire uterine covering. It's the largest of all the uh, uterine ligaments. The specific ligament here from the top, the ovarian ligament will be here down at the bottom of the ovary. All right, the fallopian tubes, it's also known as the uterine tubes or the oviducts. Any of those terms are, are fine here. And these are the passageway for the egg to get to the uterus. All right, the fallopian tubes will begin as a large, it looks like a upside down funnel structure. It's called the infundibulum. And this is surrounded by ciliated projections of tissue called the fimbriae. Now, the infundibulum will lead to a widened area of the fallopian tube called the ampulla. This will be followed by a uh, longer, much more narrow portion called the isthmus. And the fallopian tubes are connected to the superior portion of the uterus. So you're going to have one on either side of the uterus. And the fallopian tube is made up of sheets of smooth muscle that are lined with highly folded, ciliated, uh, simple columnar epithelium. And the outside of the tube is covered by a visceral peritoneum and it's suspended by a, a mesentery known as the mesosalpinx. We move on to the uh, uterus. The uterus is in the pelvic cavity, the posterior and superior to the urinary bladder, anterior to the rectum. Uh, the major portion of the uterus is called the body. Uh, the rounded superior portion between the uterine tubes is called the fundus, and this is, and the more inferior portion, the more narrow portion, is called the isthmus. Now the cervix is a valve-like portion of the uterus that would actually protrudes into the the end of the vagina, while the cervical canal communicates with the vagina. Right, the uterus, much like the ovaries, is suspended and anchored by a large series of uh, ligaments. The mesometrium attaches the uterus to the lateral pelvic wall, and the combination of the mesometrium and the mesovarium is called a broad ligament. And that extends all the way from one ovary uh, across the uterus to the other ovary. It's the largest of all the uh, uterine ligaments. Uh, the lateral cervical ligaments attach the cervix and the vagina to the lateral pelvic walls. And the uterus is anchored to the anterior wall of the pelvic cavity by what's called a round ligament. All right, now we'll talk about the various layers of the uterine wall. Uh, the first one, perimetrium, is the outermost layer, also known as the visceral peritoneum. Uh, next layer, the myometrium, is consists of smooth muscle. The, the prefix myo is always referenced to muscle. And then the innermost lining is the endometrium. This inner lining is a mucosa layer of columnar epithelium and also of secretory cells that have two divisions. You have the basal layer, which is responsible for regenerating the uterine lining each month as a woman has her monthly cycle. And you also have the functional layer. 
This will shed about every 28 days when a woman has her period. I right, now talk about a clinical application. Talk about endometriosis. Now, each month, uh, women of childbearing age shed and replace the endometrium. This is the layer that actually gets lost each month. Now, in many women, this endometrial tissue somehow escapes the uterus and actually implants in the abdominal and pelvic cavities, where this tissue responds to hormonal cycles, continuing the buildup of the decay each month, causing scarring and damage to the abdominal organs. Now, many women with endometriosis have no symptoms, while others experience severe abdominal pain and severe back pain around the time of their period each month. Now, untreated endometriosis can cause adhesions to the intestines and also to the urinary bladder, and either one of these will require uh, surgery to correct it. Now, this is the most common case of infertility because they end up blocking the uterine tubes or the fallopian tubes. All right, we'll talk about the uterine blood supply. Uh, the endometrium is going to be very highly vascular. Uh, the blood is supplied by the uterine artery, which will branch from the internal iliac arteries on each side. And from here, the uterine arteries will split into you know, supplying the myometrium and then the radial arteries, which supply the endometrium. Uh, the straight radial arteries will supply the basal layer, and the spiral radial arteries will supply the functional layer, uh, decaying and regenerating each month as a part of the menstrual cycle, and also undergoing spasms, which contribute to the shedding of the endometrial lining each month. And the blood will return uh, to the circulation via the network of uh, the venous sinuses. All right, now we'll talk about the uh, vagina. Uh, vagina is a strong fibromuscular tube approximately 10 centimeters long, running from the uterus to the outside of the body. Its purpose is to uh, receive the penis during intercourse and also to allow passage of the menstrual fluid out of the uterus. It's also known as the birth canal because its primary function is to allow the movement of, of the baby out of the uterus during childbirth. And the external opening of the vagina may be covered by a perforated membrane called the hymen. Now, a torn hymen was once thought to prove that a woman had had uh, sexual intercourse. But many hymens are highly perforated and are very easily ruptured just by normal day-to-day -day activities, such as riding a bike or jogging or riding a horse. So an intact hymen is not a valid test for virginity. All right, now we'll talk about the external genitalia. And the external genitalia are collectively known as the vulva and are a complex and a very important part of reproduction. Now, the vulva is surrounded by two prominences called the labia majora. These are rounded fat deposits that meet and protect the rest of the external genitalia. The word labia is reference to lip and majora means major or larger. Sometimes you'll see this as majorus or majus or majora. They all mean larger because there's a labia minora also. Now the labia majora meet anteriorly to form the mons pubis which is covered by the pubic hair. So it's the rounded mass that sits on top of the pubic bone. Now, between the labia majora is an opening known as the pudental cleft with the vestibule located within here. And th within there, you'll find the urethra and the vagina. And there are several glands that surround the uh, vestibule to help keep it uh, lubricated and moist. All right, the lateral border of the vestibule is formed by the very thin structures called the labia minora. And these labia minora will meet anteriorly to form the pupus. And just uh, posterior pupus is the clitoris which is a small erectile structure about two centimeters in uh, diameter. So the labia minora form what's basically the, the hood of the clitoris, the prepuce of the clitoris. Uh, just like the penis in males, the clitoris will engorge with blood during uh, sexual arousal. However, the clitoris will increase in diameter, not in length. And the clitoris will have a shaft, a body, and a glands, which is the very tip of the, the clitoris. All right, here we have a image of the external uh, female genitalia, the vulva. This rounded mass here, this fat tissue here, will be the mons pubis, where you find the actual pubic hair. So these larger, larger structures, larger folds are the labia majora, and where they fuse together or meet together will be the mons pubis. The thinner structures here, here and here, with the labia minora, and they fuse right on top of where the clitoris would, would be here. All right, just below the clitoris would be the the urethral opening, so where you, where urine would be expelled from, and then the opening to the vagina, and then the perineum, which is space between uh, the vulva and then the anus. I'll talk about the uh, mammary glands. This is another set of external accessory sexual organs. Of course, these glands are used for production of milk, and they're housed in the breast. In young children, mammary glands are virtually identical in boys and girls. 
and at puberty, the hormones estrogen and progesterone will stimulate the pre uh, breast development within girls. Now, in, in adult females, the breast will consist of between 50 and 20 glandular lobes and lots of adipose tissue. Each of these lobes is divided into smaller lobules, which house the milk secreting sacs. These are called alveoli. Of course, these are found when a woman is lactating. Now, milk that's made in the alveoli travels through a series of ducts and sinuses, eventually reaching the areola or the nipple, where the production of milk is controlled by the hormone prolactin. Here's an image of the uh, mammary glands. Lots of adipose or fat tissue here. These individual sacs here are the alveoli or alveolus for singular. All milk that's made here gets transferred down the mammary ducts here, or eventually out of the of the nipple. All right, now we'll move into the uh, reproductive physiology of the female. Now, the female reproductive uh, physiology is closely tied to a regulated cycle. Now this cycle is normally regulated via a hormonal control. Now the menstrual cycle takes approximately 28 days and will involve the ovaries and the uterus. And the ovarian cycle involves the monthly maturation and release of eggs from the ovary. And the uterine cycle consists of the monthly buildup, decay, and then the shedding of the uterine lining. All right, the cycles will begin during a woman's teen years, during puberty. Of course, that will vary greatly on each individual female, so whenever they start puberty. And will end during their 40s or 50s in menopause. Again, something that will vary you know, greatly by female. Now, the goal is to release an egg for fertilization, and also to prepare the uterus to receive that fertilized egg, and then to nourish the fertilized egg should a pregnancy result. So every month, a woman's body is preparing, releasing an egg and preparing their body just in case they do get pregnant. If a pregnancy doesn't result, the uterine lining will shed and the cycle will begin once again. All right, now I'll talk about uh, menses and menstruation. Uh, the menstrual cycle begins with the first day of the menses. Uh, the menstruation is a term uh, referring to the actual shedding of the endometrium, the actual period itself. And menses is a reference to the time during which a woman is menstruating. So the time when a woman is having her period. So menses usually last about four to five days, but can be longer or shorter in different women. It can vary from month to month in the same woman. Now we'll move into ovulation. Once the menses is over, the endometrium will begin to proliferate, basically readying, readying itself for the egg that's about to be released from the ovary, which is what's called ovulation. Right, from day one to 14, the oocyte, or the egg cell, is undergoing a number of developmental changes, getting ready for ovulation on approximately day 14. The ovulation is the release of a mature egg from the ovary. Now the egg will travel from the ovary to the uterus, which has been preparing for it. If that oocyte is fertilized by a sperm cell, it will implant into the thickened endometrium. If it doesn't implant within a few days, the endometrium will begin to decay and menstruation will occur within two weeks. Right, we'll talk about uh, the menstrual cycle phases. The time between the end of the menses and ovulation is known as the follicular or proliferative phase. It's during this time where the endometrium is prolifer proliferating and the follicles are maturing within the ovary. The time between the ovulation and the menses is known as the luteal or the secretory phase. And this is because the development of a structure called the corpus luteum in the ovary and the beginning of the secretion within the uterus. That's why it's called the luteal phase, or the secretory. All right, in this image, we have various factors that go on during the menstrual cycle. This the top image here. You have the various levels of FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, and luteinizing hormone. You have what's going on with the follicle as it develops and up to ovulation, and what happens after ovulation. This one, you have levels of estrogen and progesterone, how they go up and down during various days. And here the relative thickness of the endometrial lining. And we have the, the bleeding here in the very beginning stages. Then a repair and then getting thicker again. So the actual bleeding that you get each month isn't at the end of the cycle. It's at the very beginning of the cycle. And the last one here, uh, basal body temperature. And you see that this key point here, ovulation, is around day 14. This is where lots of things start to change. There's a very large increase in luteinizing hormone which causes ovulation which will all lead to a potential pregnancy. Again you have the uh, menstruation in the beginning, proliferation phase, 
than the luteal phase. All right, now I'll talk about oogenesis, uh, follicle development, and then ovulation. The process of egg production is called oogenesis. The prefix oo here is always a reference to eggs, and genesis means the beginning of or the creation of. So oogenesis begins with the birth of oogonia, or egg stem cells, in the ovary. The oogonia will undergo mitosis, producing millions of primary oocytes. And this happens very early on in a woman's life, and with millions of primary oocytes produced during embryonic development. So you'll have a lot of development as a female embryo is developing, and basically everything gets put on pause right before a, a female is born. And women will have all the eggs that they will ever, ever have about five months before they are born. So there's nothing you can do to increase the number of eggs that you have. See, the primary oocytes, since they are born through the process of mitosis, still have 46 chromosomes. So they must undergo meiosis to become gametes, which only have 23 chromosomes. So this will allow them to combine with a sperm cell to give you the final 46 that you need. And primary oocytes stay basically on pause until the girl goes through puberty. At this point, they will continue their development. Now, primary oocytes are eventually surrounded by helper cells called the uh, granulosa cells. At this point, this whole structure is called a primordial follicle. Eggs will stay dormant until puberty. Hormonal signals during puberty will cause some of these primordial follicles to enlarge and increase the number of granulosa cells. And these enlarged cells are called primary follicles. Once a girl reaches puberty, one primary follicle will become a secondary follicle each month. The secondary follicle will not complete its development unless it is ovulated and then fertilized. Just before ovulation, a secondary follicle will fill with fluid and will move toward the surface of the ovary where it becomes a visible lump. The fimbriae of the uterine tubes will brush the surface of the ovary causing the follicle to rupture. When this follicle ruptures, the secondary oocyte is released from the ovary into the peritoneal cavity and these finger-like extensions, these fimbriae, will actually sweep it into the infundibulum of the fallopian tubes. Right, that leads you to uh, fertilization. As the egg travels down the uterine tube, it will either be fertilized or it won't be. There's only two options that you have here. If there are sperm present and within the uterine tube and all the conditions match, the sperm will penetrate the egg, which will lead to fertilization and then we'll, that will trigger the rest of the egg development. The successfully fertilized egg will now have 46 chromosomes. At this point, it's called a zygote. It's the first cell that we all start off as, this one fertilized egg, zygote. Now, the zygote will enter the uterus and implant into the proliferated endometrium. This will stop the woman from experiencing menses. So fertiliz fertilization actually occurs in the fallopian tubes, not in the uterus. And once you have this fertilization, the normal bleeding and normal hormonal changes that you have each month will stop because you don't want to lose the endometrial lining because anything that's within there will be expelled out of the body. So if you have a fertilized zygote trying to develop, that gets lost and discharged, then you're going to lose that pregnancy. Now the ruptured follicle that's left behind uh, within the ovary is now called a structure called the corpus luteum. And it will secrete hormones to help maintain the thickened endometrium to nourish the embryo. All right, unfertilized eggs. If there is no sperm in the uterine tube and, or the conditions are not right or something can go wrong, the zygote will not implant into the uterus. If there is no implantation within a uh, few days, the uterine lining will begin to degenerate and the woman will have her period. And then the egg and anything else in the endometrial lining will be swept out in the menstrual flow. And the corpus luteum will eventually become the corpus albicans and eventually will disappear. All right, now I'll talk about hormonal control of female reproduction. Hormones from the hypothalamus and the pituitary and the ovary are what will control the female cycle. Now, hormone levels are generally controlled by a negative feedback loop. Now, hormones are often released as a part of, part of a hierarchy, with the hypothalamus releasing a hormone that will control the pituitary, which will in turn release a hormone that controls another organ. There are four hormones that control the menstrual cycle. You have estrogen and progesterone coming from the ovary. You have luteinizing hormone, or LH, and then FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, and those two come from the pituitary. Estrogen and progesterone levels will increase starting at puberty. The release of gonadotropin releasing hormone, or GNRH, 
from the hypothalamus causes an increase in the secretion of LH and FSH from the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. So again, you have a hormone from the hypothalamus telling the pituitary to, to increase production of LH and FSH. FSH will initiate the development of the primary follicles each month, while LH triggers ovulation. Uh, during the follicular stage, estrogen levels will continue to rise as more and more is secreted by the, the developing follicle, which will stimulate the proliferation of the uterine lining. Uh, so going back to this image here we saw a few minutes ago, you see right here on day 14, a very large increase in the luteinizing hormone, LH. This is what actually will cause ovulation each month. And of course, at that point, you get estrogen levels and progesterone getting higher to help, or help to nourish the developing, the developing zygote. Now, estrogen will exert a positive influence on the hypothalamus, which will increase the secretion of GnRH, which will then increase LH and FSH. Now, this positive feedback loop will continue raising hormone levels until ovulation occurs. At that point, the feedback loop will, will reverse itself. All right, uh, progesterone. Once ovulation occurs, the feedback loop will reverse itself. Uh, the corpus luteum will begin to secrete progesterone, as well as a little estrogen. Estrogen, under the influence of uh, progesterone, exerts a negative feedback on the hypothalamus and pituitary, therefore decreasing GnRH, which will decrease LH and FSH. Progesterone also exerts a negative feedback on the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So during the luteal or secretory phase, LH, FSH, and estrogen levels all drop while progesterone levels go up. And these hormonal changes prevent another egg from maturing. You only want one egg to be fertilized and developing at a time. Right, for about 10 days after ovulation, progesterone levels will remain high as the corpus luteum will continue to secrete the progesterone. And the progesterone's effects on the uterus is to maintain the buildup of the endometrium and also to decrease uterine contractions. You don't want the uterus to go through its normal contractions because then it will or dislodge anything that's trying to implant within the endometrial lining. If no pregnancy results, the corpus luteum will degenerate and progesterone will no longer be produced. And this decreasing levels of progesterone will cause the, the degeneration of the endometrial lining. That tissue will basically the vessels that are supplying the endometrial lining are now cut off of oxygen. So when that happens, tissue will start to die. So that's what you are losing each month with your, with your monthly period. That bleeding is actually the, the innermost lining losing oxygen and then sloughing off. Now decreased progesterone levels uh, release the hypothalamus and the pituitary from its inhibitory effects. So therefore, FSH and LH levels will go start to go up again and the cycle will start all over again. Right, now we'll talk about uh, pregnancy. If a pregnancy does result, the implanted fertilized egg secretes a hormone called HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin. This is the hormone that home pregnancy tests are actually checking for. So this hormone isn't made unless there's a fertilized egg there to secrete it. The HCG will stimulate the corpus luteum to keep secreting progesterone and some estrogen to help maintain the uterine lining so we can have a place to implant and a place to start to develop and gestate. See, at around three months gestation, uh, the placenta will begin to secrete its own progesterone and estrogen, and thus becoming, a, as, thus becoming an endocrine organ. All right, in this table, we have uh, various hormones uh, controlling pregnancy. Of course, their, their name and where they're secreted from and then their causes. Now, HCG, secreted by the implanted fertilized egg. And of course, it's to cause to maintain the function of the corpus luteum. Uh, estrogen and progesterone secreted by the corpus luteum in the first two months, and after that by the placenta. Uh, prolactin, that comes from the anterior pituitary gland, helps to stimulate milk production. And then oxytocin, this comes from the posterior lobe of the pituitary, this helps to induce uterine contractions, and also the uh, release of milk from the breast. All right, now I'll move on to the male anatomy. Uh, the testes are the primary genitalia, because these are the structures that will produce the male gamete, the sperm cells. And unlike the female, the primary male genitalia are external. And the ovaries for females are internal, testes for male are external. The secondary genitalia for the male include the penis, uh, epididymis, vas deferens, and the urethra. And then also several accessory glands, including the prostate gland, the seminal vesicles, and the bulbal urethral glands. Just like we talked about with uh, the female. 
if it's not a primary organ, if it's not the ovary for females or if it's not the testes for males, it's considered to be an accessory, no matter where it's found, no matter what it does. General image of a male reproductive system. We have the testes here. Testis is singular. Testes would be referring to both. A penis here, the urinary bladder here, a prostate gland here, the last part of the sigmoid colon and the anus here. And we'll reference many of these structures listed on this image. I first we start off with the testes or testicles. Either term is fine. These are paired organs that are suspended uh, in a sac called the scrotum. These will hang on either side of the penis. Each testis is surrounded by a serous membrane called the tunica vaginalis. This will originate from the peritoneum. Now deep inside the tunica vaginalis is the tunical albuginia. Now, inside the, uh, the testes, they are divided into around 250 to 300 wedges called lobules. And each of these will contain one the four tubes called the seminiferous tubules. And these are the, the location of actual sperm production in the seminiferous tubules. Now these tubules are made up of epithelium and areolar tissue. They contain the stem cells for the sperm cells and also the helper cells called the Sertoli cells. So sperm cells are actually made in the seminiferous tubules of the testes. The penis. Uh, the penis is a, from a Latin word that means tail, is the delivery organ for the sperm. Delivered or transport sperm from the male to the female. The attached portion of the penis is called the root. While the freely moving part is called the shaft or the body. The tip of the penis, called the glans penis, uh, is covered by a loose section of skin called the foreskin, also known as a prepuce. You know, unless a man has a circumcision, this is the part that does get removed. Now, internally, the penis contains the urethra, which is a transport passage for both sperm and urine, so it has a dual function for males. Also, internally, uh, you'll find three erectile bodies, which are basically tubes of uh, spongy like uh, tissue and a network of blood sinuses. This is how the penis becomes erect as blood will engorge this tissue. All right, uh, the epididymis. There are several ducts in the male reproductive system. Uh, the epididymis is a comma-shaped looking duct found in the posterior and the lateral part of the testes. The tube is very, very highly coiled, and if it were unraveled, it would measure about six meters long, and that's about 19 and a half feet. There's going to be you know, two of these, one on each uh, testes, or one on each testis. So their left testis has an epididymis that's about 20 feet long, and the right testis has an epididymis that's about 20 feet long. So that's how tightly coiled it is. And the epididymis is made up of uh, pseudostratified ciliated epithelium and also smooth muscle. And it's the site that sperm go to mature. They're made in the seminiferous tubules of the testes, but then they migrate toward the epididymis where they mature. Right. Uh, vas deferens, also known as the ductus deferens, only about 45 centimeters long, lighted with uh, ciliated and pseudostratified epithelium, just like the epididymis, but it has a thick, smooth muscle layer and it's surrounded by a connective tissue layer called the adventitia. Now, the vas deferens will run from the scrotum to the penis via a relatively complicated pathway. So the vas deferens will run from the anterior part of the scrotum as a part of tubes, you know, one on each side, goes up into the abdominal wall you know, through the inguinal canal, and also the pelvic cavity, then it'll turn immediately over the urethra and along the posterior bladder wall. See, posterior to the bladder, the vas deferens will join the seminal vesicle to form the ejaculatory duct, which then passes the prostate gland and then empties into the urethra. Now, between the scrotum and the inguinal canal, the vas deferens will run through a tube where you'll find blood vessels and nerves, and this structure is collectively called the spermatic cord. All right, so going back to this image here for the male, testis here, epididymis here, and the vas deferens would go from the epididymis up here, all the way around the bladder, and then it will join the seminal vesicles, uh, prostate gland, and then into the ejaculatory duct, and into the urethra out of the penis. So that's why it's 45 centimeters long. It's going up and around the bladder. And this is also the structure that is cut during a vasectomy. That's why it's called a vasectomy. You're taking the uh, vas deferens out and cutting a piece off, then cauterizing the ends so sperm cells can't get from the epididymis to be added to the ejaculate. So sperm cells can't get to the ejaculate and get out of the penis, 
then they can't get a woman pregnant. All right, now we'll talk about some accessory organs or accessory glands for the male. There are three accessory glands. Uh, first one, the seminal vesicles, highly coiled uh, structures. They're found uh, just posterior to the bladder. They're made up of pseudostratified epithelium and smooth muscle and connective tissue. Uh, the prostate gland is a chestnut-sized gland surrounding the urethra, just inferior to the bladder. It's made up of a dense mass of connective tissue, it's with muscle, with uh, embedded glands. And this is why for men who have prostate issues, they feel like they have to urinate all the time. So going back to this image again, prostate gland is here, and the bladder is just above it. So if the prostate swells or becomes irritated, it's going to irritate the bladder. A good indicator of having a prostate problem is the feeling that you always have to urinate. And then when you do go, you don't think that you went, you don't think that you voided it all out all because of the prostate's location in reference to the bladder. All right, and the third accessory gland, the bulbal urethral glands, also known as the Cowper's glands. These are pea-sized glands that are inferior to the prostate. And these glands are here to help uh, lubricate the end of the penis for uh, intercourse when the man is uh, sexually aroused. Now we'll talk about male reproductive physiology. Now, sperm production in the testes is a continuous process beginning with the, or when a boy reaches puberty and it can continue until the male dies. So unlike females, you know, females are born with all the eggs that you will ever have. But for males, they can keep making sperm cells their entire adult life. And the production of sperm, called well, spermatogenesis, much less complicated than control of ovulation. The spermatogonia, or the initial sperm stem cells, will undergo mitosis and form primary spermatocytes. These primary sp uh, spermatocytes form two secondary spermatocytes. Those will complete meiosis to form what are called spermatids. And these spermatids will go through a period of development to form immature sperm cells. And all of this will take place within the testes, within the seminiferous tubules. All right, now we'll talk about the uh, distribution of sperm development. The spermatogonia will line up against the walls of the seminiferous tubules. And the mature sperm will cluster near the lumen of the tubules. So basically, the immature sperm are on the outermost edges of the tubules. And as they mature, or as they further uh, their development get pushed toward the middle or the actual lumen of the tubule. Okay. At this point, the sperm will travel from the seminiferous tubules to the epididymis. We'll spend about two weeks uh, basically maturing and getting the ability to swim. And sperm cells that can't swim don't really have a function. So immature sperm cells can't swim. They can't move on their own. All right, if you look at a these or testis and cross section, this is what you'd see. In each of these lobules here. And within each one, you'll have very highly coiled seminiferous tubules. If we're going to zoom in on this one piece of the tubule in here, you have the immature sperm cells on the outermost edges. Further their development, they get pushed toward the middle. As you can see, the ones that are here in the middle actually have their tails, and the immature ones on the outside do not. So as they are you know, put together, they get pushed toward the middle. So as that process happens, they'll go through all these tubules, into their, this structure, the ret testis, up into the epididymis, where they will spend about two weeks maturing. All right, here's a general image of a sperm cell. Have a look. You have basically, you have basically four pieces. You have uh, the head, where you find the nucleus and the DNA, the 23 chromosomes. You have the body, where you find a large amount of mitochondria, so it's able to move and swim. Uh, the tail, which is a series of microtubules, so it allows it to move. Now on top of the head you have a structure called the acrosome. In here you'll find lots of digestive enzymes that help the sperm cells penetrate the egg cell. If this wasn't here they couldn't fertilize the egg. Okay, down here you start with the primary uh, spermatocyte after meiosis 1. It'll give you two secondary sp spermatocytes. These will each go through meiosis 2 forming spermatids. As these mature They'll be fully developed sperm cells. All right, now I'll talk about hormonal control of male reproduction. Now, testosterone is the most important sex hormone. While males are in utero, the secretion of HCG by the placenta stimulates embryonic secretion of testosterone, basically turning the embryo into a more masculine organism. As we develop, all humans start off as female, what determines if we remain female or turn into males is the presence of testosterone. If testosterone is there in high enough concentrations, then 
that fetus will turn into a male. If there is not enough testosterone there, then the fetus will remain female. Now, after birth, there is very little testosterone that's secreted until the male reaches puberty. And this small amount of testosterone inhibits the GnRH. Now, at puberty, there are two hormonal changes that occur that signal the beginnings of maturity. First, you have testosterone secreted by the testes, and it will greatly increase. Second, the testosterone no longer inhibits GnRH. So therefore, therefore, FSH and LH will further enhance testosterone production, creating a major positive feedback loop. All right, we'll talk about uh, male secondary sexual characteristics. Uh, testosterone secretion at puberty brings about the development of various changes within the male's body. More body hair, more facial hair, uh, pubic hair growth, uh, the deepening of the voice, uh, increased muscle mass, and increased bone mass. Right, now we'll talk about a clinical application, uh, androgen insensitivity syndrome. Now testosterone secretion in utero is important for turning the fetus into a male fetus. Now genetically, males who are not sensitive to testosterone will not respond to these effects and will not develop normal male reproductive systems. Now androgen insensitivity is a genetic disorder that can result in a very broad range of malfunctions of the male reproductive system. From a complete lack of external or internal genitalia to males with uh, ambiguous genitalia or patients who have uh, normal male genitalia, but who are sterile. So the treatment of this condition will depend on the severity of the malformation. All right, now we'll talk about LH, FSH in males. Now, the hormones LH and FSH affect males exactly as they do females, and they are there to stimulate gamete development. And they are regulated in exactly the same way they are regulated in females. So GnRH is released from the hypothalamus, which will stimulate LH, FSH secretion from the pituitary. So there's no difference in in function or in control here for males or females. All right, now we'll talk about uh, erection and ejaculation. When the male is sexually aroused, the erectile bodies of the penis, the three columns of spongy tissue, uh, will become engorged with blood for stiffening and expanding the penis, which will produce an erection. In order for the sperm to leave the body, there must be ejaculation, which is the expulsion of the semen, which is the sperm cells plus all the assorted chemicals go along with that. This ejaculation must take place for sperm to exit the body. All right, now we'll talk about the passage of sperm. Uh, the smooth muscle will contract throughout the ducts and glands of the male system and will propel the sperm from the epididymis into the vas deferens and then into the pelvic cavity. As the sperm cells past these seminal vesicles, the vesicles will add a secretion of fructose and other chemicals that help aid the sperm. They basically get a, a an energy boost from the seminal vesicles by getting a source of sugar. And from here, the sperm and these chemicals enter the ejaculatory duct, passing through the prostate gland. And the prostate gland will add to this combination a alkaline fluid to help protect the sperm cells, because they're about to enter a an, an acidic environment like the vagina. So in order to protect them, they are given an extra coating from the prostate glands. So at this point, the semen will pass through the uh, bulbal urethral gland, which will add mucus to the semen, again to help lubricate the end of the penis when the male gets aroused for intercourse. And then finally, the semen enters the urethra as he carried outside of the body. So the term semen doesn't mean just the sperm cells. Semen means the sperm cells plus all these secretions from the bulbal urethral glands, prostate gland, and the seminal vesicles. So it's, so it's basically everything that comes out of the penis during ejaculation. All of that is semen. All right, uh, the sperm in the female. If a man is having intercourse with a woman and then ejaculates, the sperm will enter the vagina and make their way into the uterine tubes. Now the female reproductive system is not very hospitable to sperm, and many sperm cells will die immediately. Now if there is an egg waiting to be fertilized, uh, sperm will find the egg and attempt to penetrate it for fertilization. Now there's new research that suggests that the egg is not a you know, passive participant in this process, but may actually engulf the sperm and even choose which sperm they allow to fertilize it. Instead of this, the egg sitting there waiting for a sperm cell to penetrate it and fertilize it, they actually have a role with picking out which sperm cell 
become fertilized with. And you will only have one sperm cell that will fertilize the egg. After this happens, the now fertilized egg will form a, a shell on the outside to prevent other sperm cells from entering it and fertilizing it. All right, now we'll talk about uh, pregnancy. Uh, pregnancy occurs when an egg is fertilized by sperm cells, and then that is now implants in the uterus. Now, the period of time where the developing baby grows in the uterus is called the gestation period, which is approximately 40 weeks long. Uh, if a baby is born uh, 36 to 37 weeks gestation, this is considered to be premature. See, the first eight weeks of gestation of the developing fertilized egg is called the embryo. During this time, the organs and systems are fundamentally formed. And after this period, it is now called a fetus. So the terms embryo and fetus are not interchangeable. They do mean very different things. It, they indicate a level of development. So basically, the first two months of development, it's an embryo. And any time after that, it's called a fetus. In general overview of the different stages, you have fertilization up here. As it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you have an embryo. Then after the second month ends, or the eighth week ends, you now have a fetus. It will develop into more and more specialized and a larger and larger organism. Here's an actual photo of a fetus at week uh, number nine, so the very beginning stages of the fetal stage. You know, some structures are, are identifiable. Of course, the developing eye here, the hand. You can see, you can see the notches that, that will eventually become the fingers, even though there's still more webbing here. See, the growing fetus is nourished by a spongy structure called the placenta, which is attached to the fetus and then the mother by the umbilical cord. Now, the fetus is encased in a, a membranous sac called the amnion, which will contain the amniotic fluid. So when a woman's water breaks, this is the fluid that is actually coming out. So going back to this image, this clear sac all the way around this fetus is the amnion. And so it will be filled with fluid. And eventually this bag will get you know, more and more filled up because as the baby gets bigger, and when that sac ruptures, amniotic fluid will come out, and that's your water breaking. Now, labor is a process in which the fetus is delivered from the uterus through the vagina, or the birth canal, then outside of the body. All right, stages of labor. There are three stages to labor. Uh, the first one is the dilation stage, where the smooth muscles in the uterus will begin to contract, which will move the fetus down the uterus, causing the cervix to begin to dilate. The second stage, uh, expulsion, begins when the cervix is fully dilated, to about uh, 10 centimeters, and the fetus is actually delivered. And generally, the head will present first, called crowning, and the baby's mouth is suction to take its first breath to avoid breathing in mucus into the respiratory tract. That's how it normally should go. If the baby is a breech uh, presentation, this is where the, uh, the buttocks or the legs will appear first instead of the head. And then the last stage of labor, the placental stage, is the delivery of the placenta, and that's actually called the afterbirth. If all you know of delivering a baby is what you see on TV or on movies, you think that the baby comes out, you clean it off, put it in a blanket, and everything's done. Well, there's a lot more stuff that has to come out after a baby. The placenta must come out. There are various images of stages of delivery. First one, dilation. You have the cervix starting to dilate. Then you have baby coming out during the expulsion stage. And the placental stage, the placenta, or the afterbirth, must be removed from the uterus, either through normal delivery or by surgical means. All right, now we'll talk about a clinical application with uh, contraception. Now, the prevention of pregnancy is termed contraception and can be accomplished by a number of means, including an IUD, which is a intrauterine device, uh, spermicidal agents, uh, birth control pills, and shields, such as a diaphragm or a condom. Now, sterilization of a male can be accomplished by a procedure called the vasectomy, which where the vas deferens is tied off to prevent sperm from exiting the penis. Now there is a corresponding procedure to the vasectomy in females called the tubal ligation, where getting their tubes tied. Instead of cutting off the vasectomy, like you, you would in males, you are tying off the fallopian tubes. So ends are uh, pulled out, cut, and then carterized so eggs can't be fertilized by sperm cells. All right, now we'll talk about some diseases of the female reproductive system. Amenorrhea, this is the absence of menstruation. A dysmenorrhea, a painful or difficult menstruation. Not just a regular cramping or bloating feeling, but a very painful or very difficult menstruation. Uh, PMS, premenstrual syndrome. Large variety of symptoms that affect many parts of the body, including uh, the emotions. Uh, vaginitis is an inflammation of the vagina, usually caused by a microorganism such as a, a bacteria or a yeast. Now, some infections are caused by STDs. It can be either viral or bacterial or fungal. Uh, cervical cancer is diagnosed by having a pap smear. 
which is a smear of the scrapings of the cervical cells to detect uh, any presence of uh, cancerous cells. Ectopic pregnancy is the implantation or the growing embryo in the uterine tubes, not in the uterus. This can be uh, very serious if not corrected very quickly. Abruptio placenta is a premature separation of the placenta from the uterine wall. And this can result in the death of the fetus if the baby isn't quickly delivered. The uh, postpartum depression is a psychological state occurring when the, or after the delivery of the baby that could result in the mother harming herself or the baby in the, the more serious cases. Uh, mastitis, the inflammation of the breast occurring at any stage in males or females, but is usually more associated with females as they are lactating. Uh, breast cancer, leading cause of death in women between the ages of 32 to 52 killing about 46,000 women a year. Now males can also get breast cancer, but at a much lower rate. Estimated to be about 1,000 cases in 2003 versus 182,000 female cases in that same year. Now treatments may include any combination of a complete mastectomy to a lumpectomy, a partial mastectomy, a chemotherapy, or radiation therapy. And the breast self-exam is the most important preventative measure that all women should perform each month. All right, now we'll talk about diseases of the male reproductive system. Erectile dysfunction disorder, or EDD. Uh, the penis is unable to become fully erect. Uh, treatments for this include medications that will increase blood flow to the penis. And the inability to develop an erection is called impotency. Crip This is the failure of the testes to fully descend into the scrotum. And this will result in infertility if not corrected. As we develop, the testes will descend from the abdominal cavity to the pelvic cavity. And from there, it will pass through the inguinal canal and go outside of the body into the scrotum. But in this condition, that doesn't happen. They remain in the pelvic cavity. Let's see, next one, hydrocele. This is an abnormal collection of fluid within the testes. Uh, BPH, benign prostatic uh, hypertrophy. This is an enlargement of the prostate gland, more commonly seen in males over the age of 50. Uh, prostate cancer, a slow-growing cancer that affects males uh, in this age group and can be uh, detected by a PSA test. An early diagnosis of this condition will increase your survival rates dramatically. All right, in this image, we have a example of BPH. You have the urinary bladder up here. You have the prostate gland here, then the urethra here. But with BPH, you have hypertrophy or an increased uh, mass of, of cells in the prostate. So when that happens, that basically pinches off the urethra. It will also irritate the uh, cells of the urinary bladder. Uh, testicular cancer, this of course will start in the testes. It's relatively rare cancer, but most common cancer between men between the ages of 15 and 34, and very, very treatable, of course, if caught early enough. All right, uh, some points of interest uh, for this chapter. Tissues grow and are replaced and are repaired by asexual reproduction. This is where cells make identical copies of themselves. And this happens all over the body as tissues are as they're growing and being repaired and replacing it. Uh, some tissues, such as the epidermis, uh, blood, and bone, will replace themselves on a continuous basis and always done by asexual reproduction or by mitosis. If an organism is going to reproduce sexually, it must use very specialized cells called gametes. And each gamete will only have half the typical number of chromosomes for that animal. That's because you want to combine or half the chromosomes from one individual plus the gametes from another individual to form a new, new organism with a complete set of chromosomes. And for humans, uh, gametes are the eggs for females and the sperm for males. These are produced by a special type of cell division called meiosis. Each of these will only have 23 chromosomes. Your normal body cells will have 46, but your sex cells only have 23. And they will not be identical to each other or to the, the original cell that created them. Is how we get genetic variety. So you get the 23 chromosomes from an egg fused with the 23 chromosomes from the sperm. That's how you get a new, new individual produced. The cells undergoing meiosis go through two divisions. The chief difference between uh, mitosis and meiosis is the pairing of the homologous chromosomes that are alike in size and shape and genetic content during meiosis. Human reproduction can be described as a cycle, known as the human life cycle. Now, adult humans have uh, specialized organs called gonads, which will produce gametes you know, through the process of meiosis. Now, gametes will combine with each other during sexual reproduction, and this will give you uh, fertilization or conception. This fertilized egg is now called a zygote. And the zygote is the beginning cell that all humans start off as. That one cell will become two, two become four, then eight, and 16, and so on. So eventually you'll form an embryo, and then a fetus, and then a baby, and then 
and the baby will develop into a child, and then finally an adult. Productive system consists of uh, several internal genitalia, and uh, the gonads will produce the eggs, which are the gametes. The uh, uterine tubes, or fallopian tubes, provide a passageway for the egg to get to the uterus. And the uterus is also the incubator for the fertilized egg. The vagina is the birth canal, connecting the uterus to the outside world. And the external genitalia include the external opening to the vagina and several protective structures. The female reproductive physiology is relatively complicated and organized around a monthly cycle of changes that occur in the ovaries and in the uterus, collectively known as the menstrual cycle. The cycle be begins with uh, menstruation, the shedding of the uterine lining. After that lining, the endometrium has finished shedding. It will begin to build up again in a process called proliferation. As this is occurring, the egg is maturing within the ovary. Eventually, that follicle will be released from the ovary, a process called ovulation, and will travel to the uterus. If fertilization happens, then a fertilized egg will implant within the thickened endometrial lining, and a pregnancy will result. If the egg is not fertilized, the endometrium will degenerate and it will be lost in menstruation. The control of the menstrual cycle is accomplished by four hormones, estrogen, progesterone, LH, and FSH. Uh, during puberty, the ovaries will begin to secrete larger amounts of estrogen and progesterone, which cause the development of the female secondary uh, sexual characteristics and then also the, the set the cycle in motion. And the cycle works in this way. The hypothalamus of the brain will release GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone, which will cause the pituitary to increase uh, secretion of LH and FSH. Those two will cause follicles to develop and eventually trigger ovulation. The estrogen levels will continue to rise as the developing follicles will secrete even more estrogen, uh, which will cause a positive feedback to the hypothalamus and the pituitary, which increases FSH and LH. Positive feedback loop will continue up until ovulation. After ovulation, the ruptured follicle, what's left after the uh, after the process of ovulation, will begin to secrete progesterone and turn off the estrogen secretion. Under the influence of progesterone, the feedback loop between estrogen and the hypothalamus and the pituitary will reverse itself. It now will become a negative feedback loop. The LH and FSH levels will drop. As this happens, progesterone levels will rise in order to maintain the thickened endometrial lining, just in case a fertilization does occur. If it doesn't occur, progesterone will decrease, endometrial lining will slowly break down, and you get the, the sloughing off of the tissue, and the cycle will begin all over again. The male reproductive system has a somewhat more obvious external genitalia, such as the testes and the penis. The internal genitalia include a series of ducts, the vas deferens, the ejaculatory duct, uh, urethra, and a series of glands, the seminal vesicles, uh, prostate and the bulbal urethral glands. Uh, male reproductive physiology is not uh, cyclic, and therefore a bit less complicated than females. The sperm-like eggs develop through a process called meiosis under the control of LH and FSH. Sperm will mature in the epididymis. When a male is sexually aroused, the penis will become engorged with blood, and then the erection occurs. If the arousal will continue, uh, ej ejaculation will occur, which is the movement of sperm from the testes uh, to the penis and then out of the man's body. During the ejaculation, sperm cells will move from the epididymis through the vas deferens, through the ejaculatory duct, and out the urethra. See, along this uh, pathway, uh, the seminal vesicles, the prostate, and bubble urethral glands will add various chemicals and secretions to the sperm cells forming the what's collectively known as semen. Uh, testosterone is the chief male hormone. Uh, it is secreted by the testes. It is responsible for turning a developing fetus into a masculine organism and triggering the LH and FSH production and the development of the secondary sexual characteristics. All right, that brings us to the end of this chapter on the reproductive system. We will conclude our video series with our next video on chapter number 19.